The USS Enterprise NCC-1701 was the first Federation vessel to carry the famous name. She served with great distinction on the second half of the 23rd century and was on active duty for longer than any other Enterprise. During her 40 years of service, she was commanded by some of Starfleet's most famous captains including Christopher Pikes and James T. Kurt. If you haven't seen my first video of the original Enterprise, check out the description box below for more information. In this animation, I'll be using the 1973 Franz Joseph design blueprints, which is a much more accurate representation of the ship. This is a much more in-depth look at the interior of the ship and personally, I find the interior much more interesting. And let's face it, most of us have probably seen the exterior already. This is a rare glimpse into the original Enterprise in a fully realized 3D model. Furthermore, the 3D model is to scale since the measurements are in the blueprints. However, elevation is not provided. Even though the profile view is great as an overall view of the Enterprise, it hides about 75% of the internal space and detail of the ship. By displaying each deck, you will get a better understanding of the design philosophy and characteristics that made this iconic ship unique and special to the sci-fi genre. It is probably the most detailed 3D model you will ever see of the original Enterprise. In this comparison, we're going to start off with the Klingon Bird of Prey, which is 157 meters or 515 feet in length and 20 meters or 66 feet in height. The original Enterprise is around 288 meters or 980 feet in length and is around 88 meters or 289 feet in height. While the much larger Enterprise D is around 642 meters or 2,160 feet in length and 138 meters or 453 feet in height. As you can see from this top view, even though the Enterprise D is twice the length of the original Enterprise, the D is much larger in terms of volume and living space, with 42 decks and covering 3.5 million square meters. In my previous animation, there were many disagreements regarding the original Enterprise's ability to separate, but after extensive research and looking at many different manuals and various schematics, the ship can disconnect, which was confirmed in this paragraph from the book. On paragraph 4, the primary and secondary hull can separate, and can operate independently as a lifeboat under emergency conditions. In addition, our deck have built-in gravity, anti-acceleration, and anti-radiation force fields. These are also individually built into each turbo elevator. I have decided to break the video into two parts. Part 1 will deal specifically with the primary hull, deck 1 through 11, and part 2 will be the secondary hull and the interconnecting dorsal which would cover deck 11 to 22. As a frame of reference, the figure on the ship is about 1.8 meters or 6 feet tall, and the wall will be around 2.73 meters or 9 feet tall. The main bridge of the Enterprise NCC-1701 was located at the very top of the saucer section. It took up the entire deck and was served by a single turbo lift that delivered personnel to the back of the room. A second turbo lift was added in the 2270 refit. All the ship major systems were controlled from the bridge, though in emergency, they could be accessed by the auxiliary control room located in the engineering hall. The circular room was dominated by a primary visual display. The majority of the console were positioned around the edge of the room on a raised platform with the operator facing the wall. The captain's chair was in the center of the room, together with the helm and navigation console. At the back of the consoles and hidden from view were the head and gangway. The station on the other side of the turbo lift, relating to engineering and environmental system, weren't always manned during routine operation, their function being primarily controlled from main engineering. But what about? They can't be saved. 
In an emergency, all bridges function can be routed to the main engineering or the auxiliary manual monitor control station. And finally, we have the ship's communication, navigation subsystems, and defense and weapon console. On deck two was the science laboratory, an area set up to work in experimental or observation science. These laboratories include the chemistry lab, high energy room, the biology lab, geology lab, science officer's office, ion study, and the physics lab. Deck 3 was very similar to Deck 2, with many different science laboratories including the physics lab at the back, cosmology, and special studies. At the front was the photon torpedo bank, a botany lab, and the general utility room. Deck 4 was the junior officer's quarter. The majority of the ship's living quarter were located in the saucer section, with the senior officers and VIP guest quarters on Deck 4, 5, and 6. Every crew member on the Enterprise was provided with their own quarters, which consisted of a single room separated into two distinct areas. The quarter could be configured according to the crew's members' personal preference, but always consisting of a sleeping area and a work area. A small bathroom and shower was located off the sleeping area. Another thing to consider was that each room have either a shared or independent bathroom with a bathing tub, a bath vanity, and a toilet. The work area featured a desk with a computer access terminal. Each crew member was provided with a safe in the partition behind the desk that could be accessed by touching a series of buttons. In addition to the living quarters were the fresh water tanks. At the center was the briefing room, officers' quarters, and the hydraulic pump system. On deck 5 was the officers' quarters. It can accommodate up to 43 officers or 15 supercargo. There were about 26 singles or 16 double stateroom. In many ways, the captain's quarters were similar in design to the crew's quarter with a small bed and a desk with a computer terminal. Uh, Charlie. <sighs> Charlie, do you know uh, anything about this chess piece? At the center of Deck 5 was the officer's lounge. Three air conditioner room, circuit breaker and switching room, three emergency battery bank room, two upper phaser bank room on the port and starboard, and a total of three water pressure system. As we headed down to Deck 6, or the crew's quarters, the vast majority of the enlisted crew and junior officers shared the quarters and the bunk area on this deck. Deck 6 has the radius of 63 meters or 207 feet and at the center was the mess room with the max capacity of 178 people. In total, there were about 112 doubles and 9 quad staterooms. On the starboard was a briefing room. On the back of deck 6 were the two heat exchangers, two energy converters, and four twin impulse power units. 
There were a total of four lounges, two located on each side of the vessel. It is also considered one of the largest decks on the ship and can accommodate up to 260 crew members or 205 crew members and 55 supercargo. Furthermore, it can easily accommodate another 100 people if the living space or workspace was converted into a sleeping quarter. Similar in size to Deck 6, but more interesting was Deck 7, the main deck. At the front was the search sensors and deflectors, the Visicon room, and the mess room. The mess room has a max capacity of 44 people. Right next to the mess room was the library lounge, the medical research lab, and sick bay. As we take a closer look, the emergency bridge or battle bridge was at the center of this deck. The battle bridge duplicate the function of the main bridge, but the ability to command communicate, navigate, and with the technical station oriented toward the main viewing display. However, it lacked the science and engineering stations. In addition, there were several other rooms including the examination, operating room, and doctor's office. Near the back was the engineering computer, the engineering maintenance shop, and the chapel. In addition, four transporters for six people are located on this deck. Deck 7 can accommodate up to 112 crew members with 54 doubles in one quad stateroom. On deck 8 was the entertainment recreational facilities. Off-duty crew member will find a variety of games and pass them from which to choose from within its walls including the entertainment center, the recreational area, and a gymnasium with a locker room and showers. Try that. I don't want to do that. There were various public areas throughout the ship where the crew member could socialize, play music, three-dimensional chess, or cards. Reach for evidence, Mr. Spock. Come in, Charlie. And again. Check. At the center was the ship's main computer, which continued from the center of Deck 7. Along the outer walls were the ship's freshwater tanks, two hydraulic pump systems, and two air conditioning for the primary hall. On the back of Deck 8 was the ship's laundry and food preparation. The food preparation area has two convoys which sends the food up into the mess room located on Deck 5 and 6. In addition, there were also three 22-person emergency transporters. On the back was the elevated shaft to the secondary hall and the interconnecting dorsal attachment section, which allowed the ship to disconnect in case of an emergency. On deck 9 was the fabrication facilities. It was stated that the material reclamation and fabrication was located on this deck. At the center of deck 9 was the material reclamation facilities, basic raw material storage, and sanitary waste recovery system. With the control console along the walls, the ship was capable of fabricating non-organic, non-metallic materials, organic materials, and non-organic metallic materials. On deck 10 was the cargo and supplies, which includes the cargo transporter, and basic raw material storage. At the bottom of the primary hall was Deck 11, 
the auxiliary fire control, which includes the auxiliary fire control room. The four phaser banks. And extra storage for raw materials. I hope you enjoyed this in depth look into the original Enterprise. While the Franz Joseph design and schematics are interesting to look at, they are not canon since some of the design don't follow the series exactly. But I had to appreciate the attention to detail being made by the designer. Having modeled both the Star Wars and Star Trek capital ships, the ships on Star Trek are more believable since they have made an effort to make sure the design layout have a purpose in mind, making it far more interesting but functional at the same time. Part 2, which will cover the secondary hall, should be completed in a few more weeks. And if you want to see more animation regarding the Enterprise D and Voyager, check out my playlist on the right hand corner. Thanks for watching and I'll see you guys next time.